afternoon. We're here today with uh, Sandra Hughes Hassel, who is a professor in the School of Information and Library Science here at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I have to get it all in. <laughs> Welcome. Good to be here. Uh, Sandra, uh, to start, let's start with uh, telling us a little bit about uh, some of the roles you play uh, uh, here at the uh, University of North Carolina. Okay, I am the newest faculty member, just came mm -hmm. last July, it's been mm -hmm. a year. Mm -hmm. So I, my roles here are to um, teach in the School Library Media Program, mm -hmm. teach in the Youth Services Program, and the newest role for me that I did not have at my other university was I'm the director of the School Library Media Program, the mm -hmm. coordinator for mm -hmm. the program, sort of helping to administer that program. So that's a new role for me here, mm -hmm. and a new role for me um, in general. Great. Well, uh, um, welcome yet again, and uh, we're very pleased to have you here. Um, why don't we begin with um, uh, the, the 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 youth services uh, okay. is, is something that I, I know you've done a lot of work in, uh, uh, and you know, both on the research side as well as teaching. Uh, tell us what youth services are, and, and sort of how you know what does that mean. In my world, mm -hmm. my focus on youth services is on services for teenagers, okay. and I got interested in that because I worked with the school district of Philadelphia on, mm -hmm. in their um, in redeveloping their library programs, mm -hmm. and I had been an elementary school librarian, so my mm -hmm. work with elementary school libraries was very similar to what I had done in my career. But when I went to look at what, the te what they were doing with teenagers, I found some real disconnects between mm -hmm. the types of services they were offering for urban teens and the types of services that I knew were being offered for teens in suburban areas or more wealthy um, communities in general. Right. And so I really became interested in what we can do to provide services for urban teens and that's really been the focus of all the research that mm -hmm. I have done. And when I teach the young adult resources course here and, and when I taught it at Drexel, I really again focus on what can we do for underserved teens, many of whom are urban teenagers, so the students mm -hmm. get a big focus uh, on the kids who aren't getting the services and the kinds of services that we might be offering them and what their needs might be. So when I started looking at teenagers, um, the first project I actually did was funded by an IMLS research grant. Mm -hmm. And I did it at uh, Drexel University with Denise Augusto. We worked mm -hmm. with the Free Library of Philadelphia and the Boys and Girls Clubs of Philadelphia, mm -hmm. and we looked at the everyday life information seeking needs of urban teenagers. So in other words, what kind of information did urban teenagers need? How are they getting that information? And we really weren't interested in information for schoolwork. We were interested right. in what would make them happy, successful teenagers. Sure, <laughs> and yeah. so we did a case study, we took a case study mm -hmm. approach. <laughs> Um, modified case study approach, I guess you would say. We um, interviewed 27 teenagers, um, all of whom were low-income teenagers. Mm -hmm. The majority of them were minority teens. There was one um, Caucasian teen who agreed mm -hmm. to participate in the study. So we um, had several data collection methods. We had them keep audio journals for a week where they recorded mm -hmm. what what they were doing basically and right. the kinds of information that they needed and where they were going to get that information. We had them keep logs of the kinds of questions that came up for them and again right. an important part of that was well who do you go to, where do you go to get that information. Mm -hmm. They kept, uh, um, they took pictures in their neighborhoods of places oh, cool. where they went to get information right. and they couldn't take pictures of people because of IOB of course. Right. And then we um, analyzed that data, brought them together and did group interviews with them again trying to find out more about their information seeking needs and from that we developed a model of um, the areas that we thought teens were, urban teens in particular, were looking for information and it pretty much matched um, d different developmental models like mm -hmm. Havoc-Hurst developmental models so they weren't mm -hmm. just seeking information for schoolwork, they were seeking information for um, you know, for their own emotional health, for their physical health, for their social um, needs, how do they get right. along with other kids, how mm -hmm. do they get along with their parents, how do they relate to them. And so we began to think about, well, what can libraries do to meet those needs of urban teenagers? What kinds of services can they mm -hmm. offer? And so we're kind of on the second stage of that study now. Uh, we just submitted another IMLS grant, which we think may get funded because we just heard it was recommended. Now we're mm -hmm. just waiting to see what the director says. Mm -hmm. And with that one, we'll take the study a little bit further and, and build on the study that we we did and specifically look at the kinds of services that libraries can provide in each of those areas to meet those needs and this time we're really going to focus on how libraries can use technology to help meet those needs of teenagers. So that was sort of where I started with my interest mm -hmm. in um, urban teenagers and working on that. From that I uh, moved on to look or didn't move on but added on yeah. to it by looking at their leisure reading habits huh. because again you know we have this perception that urban teenagers 
don't read. And so I did some surveys of urban teenagers, specifically looking at middle school students and two libraries in um, Philadelphia, and found that actually they do read. It's just that mm -hmm. they read very different materials. Yeah. So again, what is it that libraries can do to build on the strength of teens? We've, we do the research, I find that teenagers are reading, look at their test scores, they're still very low. Mm -hmm. So what's, what's going on that they mm -hmm. are reading, but their test scores are really low, and what can libraries do to, to help um, fill that gap? And I'm also going to do a small study here in North Carolina to kind of build on that or to add to that with a small group of urban teens in Asheboro, which will be, it's considered urban if you look at the definition of urban <laughs> in, uh, yeah. in North Carolina. It right, is. Right. But the teens will be very different because right. all the teens I worked with in Philadelphia were minority teens. Right. Here you'll have teenagers who are urban teens who may or may right. not be minority teens. But right. in Philadelphia, they were predominantly African American. Mm -hmm. and Hispanic, mm -hmm. so right. kind of putting those two pieces together um, with the urban teenagers. And the last thing that we did was a, cause kind of honing in on a little part was yeah. that a lot of urban teenagers read something called street literature. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, which that. is it's called urban hip. It's urban hip hop. It's um, it's literature that's it's literature of the streets. It's literature yeah. that's written from their neighborhoods. It's the language of their neighborhoods. It's the um, the situations that happen in their neighborhoods, um, and so that's what they're reading. And so we wanted to look at well, what are the characteristics of those types of literature, what is it that's drawing them to this literature, and then we had, um, that's one part, and then we had a librarian in Philadelphia actually do a book discussion group with some teenagers where they read the street literature, and she used it as a way for them to talk about the street literature and how it portrayed urban teenagers and whether that was how they really were, how they really wanted to be portrayed, and what they might want to read that would, pro would allow them to see themselves in a more positive light, because urban, urban literature is actually written predominantly by men and women who um, have been drug addicts, who have been incarcerated, and right. it's actually a cautionary tale in some mm -hmm. respects. You can yeah. view it as a cautionary tale for yeah. these kids not to right. become so wrapped up in the drug culture or mm -hmm. so wrapped up in the uh, material culture mm -hmm. that they drift off into these negative pa paths. You can mm -hmm. look at it that way. Um, it does portray urban people in general in a pretty negative way right. and their communities are very dangerous and violent, yeah. which is true. And so yeah. what we were doing with this uh, book discussion group right. was she was having the kids talk about it and, is this your neighborhood? And they were like, yes, this is our neighborhood. Well, is this mm -hmm. how you want your neighborhood to be? Well, no. Well, what is it we can do to make things different? Me, and yeah. um, that was kind of interesting to see how they moved in their thinking because they would, they would, in the stories, men are very um, domineering over women, yeah. but they give the women incredible gifts. They get diamond earrings and you know, gold jewelry and right. you know yeah. fancy cars and the girls were like, oh that's great, they really love them, they're giving them all these presents and right. the librarian said, well let's step back and look at that. Well what else are they doing? Well they're doing beating, mm -hmm. you know, um, right. forced sex, right. et cetera, et cetera. Right. And the girls right. were like, oh wait a second, yeah. that's not <laughs> a good trade-off. Yeah. And so the girls began yeah. to to rethink the role they were taking in their relationships with young men. Unfortunately, the no young men came because I think you could have the same conversation with young men and how they were being portrayed and is that really sure. what they're like? Is that really what you want them to be like? So anyway, right. that's kind of where I've been going with, with um, my research and my interest, again, right. is really very much around urban teenagers and what are we doing for them and what can we do how, better How can technology them? help? Them and how can technology help? And that's what we... The study we're doing with IMLS is what we want to look at because when we did the first study with the teenagers in Philadelphia, they really did not talk about technology very much mm -hmm. except for cell phones. Mm -hmm. Whenever we would talk to them about computers, they had them in their homes, but when we had them take pictures of what where they went to get information and they took pictures of computers, they were all in like in the living room. So they didn't have mm -hmm. their own computer. Right. That, that you know, yeah. was there solely. It was the family computer. Yeah. And so they didn't talk about using, or actually when we asked them about email, and um, we didn't have um, MySpace then, right. but when we asked them about email, they yeah. said, oh, well, we don't use that. Mm -hmm. um, they relied more heavily on their cell phones. Mm -hmm. So we want to really find out you know, what technology are they really using. Um, why, if they're not using, you know, more advanced technologies, is it because they don't have it accessible, or is it, if, is it for some other reason? That they're they're not using it. and then figure out what you know what can libraries do to either help them move to using those new technologies because they've got to mm -hmm. be able to do that to be successful in school and right. also to be successful in the world or if they are using them to help build their their skills in those mm -hmm. areas so that's kind of where we're trying to go with the second IMLS grant so, so will you be giving them like um, cell phones or PDAs or computers or no we were just again more of 
that, that would have been a good that's a good idea but more again we were just going to look be, at that would really, be even yeah. a better idea yeah. <laughs> no, a, but again looking at what do they have available and how are they using what they already yeah. have available so that's kind of where we're starting um, at that point and again what are the public libraries doing because part of what you always have to, what we always have to remember with kids any kind of kid who only has um, access to technology and libraries is what is the filtering done mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because if they don't have the computer at home, that's their own personal mm -hmm. computer, so they don't have a time to be on it. That's mm -hmm. you know where it's private, mm -hmm. and they go to the public library and their filters on it. Then they can't use in many cases, you know, MySpace or the um, Teen Life. I mean, they just can't right. get into those. So you've got that restriction on them that you may not have on many teenagers, mm -hmm. or suburban teens, or um, middle class teenagers in many cases who have their own technology, or where the public libraries aren't reliant on federal mm -hmm. funds so they don't have to have filters on the machines. So, right. Because another thing I'm doing right now that I'm just jotted is I'm looking at uh, public library websites and the access they provide to health information for teenagers. Mm -hmm. And we did, uh, we're doing a content analysis of the public library websites for the top 50, or for f the 50 largest urban areas in each state. Oh, <laughs> wow. Start yeah. The top two urban areas in each of the 50 oh, states. Okay, so we're okay. looking at 101 yeah. websites yeah. looking mm -hmm. at um, including the District of Columbia. And so far what we're finding is only, um, I think I've looked at only 17% right now are provided, that I've looked at, I've only mm -hmm. looked at half of them, are, have provided any health information for teens on their young adult website. Mm -hmm. And again, I have to wonder, is that because of filters? Right. Is that because yeah, of some sort of restriction yeah. or what is it? Because if you, again, if you look at the research, 75% of teens go online to get health information. It makes sense that public libraries pr would right. provide that, especially again for kids who don't have access at mm -hmm. home, who may not have access in a private place at home to look right. at it. Right. And uh, we're seeing, so far, we're finding very little that's available yeah. to them. And the Internet Public Library has this great website for health information for teenagers. They're not even linking to that. Oh, so uh, we haven't, yeah. I've only found that link to once. In the 55 libraries that I've looked at, I'm working with a doctoctoral student right. at Drexel who's doing right. the other 46 libraries. Mm -hmm. Well, that's so, fascinating. But again, I, we were, I wanted to focus on those urban teenagers because if you look at their health care needs, their, right. their conditions are... Uh, so, so this is kind of like an information abstinence program. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I <haven't> thought about <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, no, that's a, that's a good point. <laughs> I know, I write... I, I actually have a hard time... I don't have a hard time getting the things published, but I have mm. a hard time getting presentations accepted at conferences and I think part uh -huh. of it is because it's urban teens and right. there are if, one of the reasons that Denise and I became particularly interested in working with these kids is because if you look at the literature there's very little written about them and the, right. you know at all and then mm -hmm. if you look in the library literature there was absolutely nothing written about them mm -hmm. and so they're a group of, of kids I think because of all the stereotypes in the media that people right. think, I don't want to deal with them, I don't want to be around mm -hmm. them. And that was the thing we found so wonderful in mm -hmm. Philadelphia was here we were two white middle class women. Yeah. I'm from a rural area and she's from a rural area yeah. and we went in and formed great relationships with these teenagers and they mm -hmm. told us things, you know, in their audio journals that IRB probably would like to not know <laughs> us. Yeah. And they formed a relationship mm -hmm. with us and so they're they're not frightening, they're not scary, they're not sure inarticulate, they're you're not literate, <laughs> you know, illiterate, yeah. you know, yeah. and so you can learn a lot from them that you can use for all services, but then you can mm -hmm. learn a lot from them that will help improve their own services. So that was the thing that really, I, the reason I really enjoy working with them is I feel like I empower them in some way by giving them voice. And that's when I write about it, that's what I always say. One of my reasons is to give voice to someone who doesn't have voice, um, who or if the, or you know the voice that's heard is a voice that is in a negative um, stereotype, and so that's one of my really key reasons for doing what I do. Is, and that's what I've cut my whole life has sort of been based on. In my career as a teacher, I always worked with in rural school districts that didn't have a lot of money, and then I worked with the school district of Philadelphia for years. And then you know when I moved into a research role, I wanted to continue that kind of work. I, that's my way of making a difference. Well, th th this is this is r really interesting and, and, and important, and I think uh, you are making a difference by by bringing um, not only giving voice to to these young people who are so uh, important to our future, but also to bring this to the attention of the larger um, uh, academic and scholarly community. Uh, so, um, and one um, of the questions that 
you know, was raised when I <coughs> first came here was how will you continue this work? And there are urban mm -hmm. areas here. It just sure. looks very different. And then I think mm -hmm. you can also, the same will apply to rural kids. So at some point I want to move over and look at rural, mm -hmm. you know, kids who live in very isolated rural areas, which is how I grew up with the mm -hmm. bookmobile. <laughs> and so, right. yeah. you know, mm -hmm. what are we doing to provide services mm -hmm. for um, those students? And, and how are they using technology? Is it the same? Are we making, mm -hmm. you know, are we assuming that they're using technology in the same way as mainstream kids? And maybe mm -hmm. they are, but maybe they aren't. And maybe we need to, to think about our services yeah. in a little different way. So I'm moving along in that direction. It just seems like such a, a, a rich and and, um, um, and actually important and practical kind of, 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 of research to be done and, and hopefully will lead to um, uh, better services and, and a better right. world. So um, um, more power to you. That's it. <laughs> and I guess that's, that's the, the what characterizes what my research, what I'm interested in is applied research. <clears throat> so, you know, what can I do to... Right. to, to to change things, to make things better for whoever it is that I'm working to make things better for, which is the goal of most people's research. But yeah, especially very, in this this uh, you know, sort of information and library science world, uh, I think we are closer to uh, um, application. I mean, certainly, there are some theoretical right. kinds of, of, of things, but uh, I mean, ultimately, it's uh, it's it's the information services that that people are able to take advantage of to change mm -hmm. their lives that uh, make a difference. Um, Let's um, shift a little bit to this this other responsibility you have, which which is uh, related, but uh, but uh, is is actually perhaps more uh, sort of imbued in our, our our educational tradition, and that's the school library and you know, where it's been, uh, where it is now, where it's going. I mean, as a leader in in, in school libraries, uh, you know, you'll have a lot to say about this. And, and um, it, one of the the things that Evelyn Daniel, one of our Colleagues here uh, has has uh, sort of suggested uh, to me is is that in the past a lot of our leadership came out of um, the, the the people who who were school based uh, in mm -hmm. school library uh, uh, programs were quite strong and in library schools and information programs are around the country and that and that is is less so today it seems to be more driven by technology but perhaps it's uh, it, we're we're starting to see that turn again are, mm -hmm. are you sensing any of that or no, I'm I mean, just thinking about the people that she's talking about the you know Ken Haycock Mike Eisenberg she's right yeah. I had never thought about yeah. it in that respect that in the library <coughs> and information field. Field, a lot of the leaders did come mm -hmm. out of the school library um, portion of it. Well, I mean, I, it just yeah, it, I just it, hadn't thought about that, yeah. but she's absolutely right. So, yeah. um, well, I mean, you, you know, we start. With, yeah, it, it, it's really you the, know, we the have, field has grown so much. I think that's part of oh, it because okay. when they became leaders, we were very much an LS world. Right. And now the IS has been added, so there's so many more faculty members mm -hmm. and the. the, the the schools have grown, the departments have grown, whatever they're right. called at this particular right. university, and mm -hmm. so they get so many more faculty members involved right. in the research, in the publishing, in the um, conferences and so forth, that I think mm -hmm. you have, I don't know if it's not, you just have different leaders and a different, you know, there's just kind of a different flow and ebb mm -hmm. to it than I think it probably was in that traditional, and I, I would think probably the school library folks were the ones who were out on the technology front sure. early because mm -hmm. technology was being introduced into the educational environment in which they worked, mm -hmm. um, and it really wasn't. It wasn't <coughs> libraries, but more in a um, behind the scenes, you know, helping with the the, the chores of librarianship. Yeah, the media whereas center it, stuff. Yeah. Whereas in the yeah. school library, yeah. it was up front and yeah. central. You were trying yeah. to always begin, you know, figuring out how do you use you know, whatever the first technology, or you microfilm or TV or right. whatever it is to improve teaching and learning. So mm -hmm. that was the focus early on. And now right. it's become the focus of the entire profession. How do we use the technologies to enhance not just our own de delivery of our services, right. but um, how do we use it to enhance the experience for the um, patron? So public libraries are seeing themselves as educators. Mm -hmm. Academic librarians are seeing themselves as educators. Mm -hmm. I, I would even argue that corporate librarians are doing education. Special librarians are doing education. So we've all kind of moved to a different um, level. And so maybe at that point where school librarians were out in the front, now we're sort of there with everybody else. And <laughs> now we just push out a little bit more, maybe. <laughs> yeah, that's, so. that's a good way to think about it. Um, I mean, the it's beyond just delivery of, of information to actually use. Right. And and, and school libraries had always had right. that, that, that function. Yeah, and so we were, you know, we were mm -hmm. kind of ahead of the curve in terms of that, yeah. but now everybody's focused on information mm -hmm. literacy, whereas that mm -hmm. used to just be what school librarians, or that right. was 
you know, primarily the what school librarians did, mm -hmm. it was their job, now it's everybody's job mm -hmm. to be concerned with information literacy and, and you know, you're concerned with information literacy be, as you design an interface. Mm -hmm. You know, that's always in the back of your mind, that's become mm -hmm. front and cen center, I think, mm -hmm. to a lot of our thinking where that used to just be what school librarians did mm -hmm. and other kinds of librarians didn't concern themselves so much with that. So I think that might be some of what why those people were the leaders at that point mm -hmm. in time, and now they're many leaders. <laughs> right. Among them are some sc are, are school library people as well as academic yeah. and mm -hmm. so on. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So where are school libraries today? Uh, are they healthy or are, are we? Um... It depends on where you are. Ah, okay. So whether or not they're healthy, it depends. I think it depends on the um, attitude that you take <laughs> as to whether or not you perceive them as being healthy. Uh, I think you can. Uh, if, you, if you're always comparing yourself to the ideal, then you're probably going to, as a school librarian, then you're probably going to think that you're not healthy. Mm -hmm. But if you're always striving to do the best you can in the situation that you have with the vision in mind, mm -hmm. <laughs> then you're more likely to see yourself as being healthy yeah. and, being, and making a difference and, and you know, taking small steps to get to that you know, ideal vision that the profession spouses for school libraries so I think a lot of it has to do with attitude so if you go to you know you go to conferences you can see people who are in um, you know really good really wealthy school districts with you know all the equipment and all the resources possible and they still may not think they have a viable program and they still want somebody to rescue them mm -hmm. or you can see and you can juxtapose those with people who like I saw in Philadelphia who are in conditions that are just unimaginable and they are right there you know knowing that they're making a difference in the way that they can make a difference right. I think a lot of it has to do with attitude yeah. that's uh, when I was at the ALA conference that was something that struck me last week mm -hmm. was the differences in vibes in rooms and you know, I was at a YALSA mm -hmm. meeting where it was just so positive and it was it was the yeah. 50th anniversary of YALSA the Young Adult Library Services Association mm -hmm. and it was just the whole thing was about how over the last 50 years we've grown and changed and it was just a celebration of all the successes. And then you might go in another room and it was, oh, what are we going to do? You know, technology is <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> taking over. You know, it's, there was just such a difference in the uh -huh. attitude and right. spaces. But that Yalsa space was the most, for the, of, the, of the sessions I went to, it was just so, um, for me, felt so good. And everybody was excited in the room and they were clapping for each other. And I thought, wow, this is the attitude to have. Because I know public libraries are not in, in many cases, are not in any better shape than school libraries right. are. But here was a group of people who, for some reason, mm -hmm. Were very uh, upbeat that day. <laughs> no, that's great. So, it, it does make a big difference. Yeah, so that's kind of where I. So I would like to see more, more emphasis um, in school library programs on how do you take what you have and do the best with what you have. Mm -hmm. Not meaning that you don't shoot for the ideal and that, that you don't keep that in mind, because at, at the end of the day, that's where we all want to be. But how do I get there? Not and not. Not I need to wait for a state legislature to step in and mandate school libraries, or I need to wait for the federal government to come in and get X number of dollars to school libraries. But given the world we live in today, the financial situation, the political situation, you know, giving school li potential school librarians the strategies that they can use to do the best in the situation that they're in, mm -hmm. and um, so that's that makes all very good sense to me. Um, I'm not sure how to do it, but that's what I... <laughs> well, it, it, it relates to um, you know, something that uh, I, I like to tell my students about intelligence. Um, uh, intelligence is, is not about how much information you've got, uh, but what you do with the information you have. And that's exactly what you're talking about, is how do we take what, whatever we have as resources and, and maximize them. And, that, and that's, um, uh, I think, it, it, it applies across uh, all, all sorts of fields. That's one of the reasons I... Uh, went to the evidence-based practice workshop or the conference that Joanne, mm -hmm. um, that UNC sponsored, right. that Joanne was part of helping make happen and talked about school libraries there because I, Ross Todd is at um, um, Rutgers, Rutgers University, mm -hmm. you know, has, has been talking about evidence-based mm -hmm. practice for, in school librarianship in particular mm -hmm. since about um, early 2000 or so. Mm -hmm. And I think that is somewhere we need to go more because what that is, is what's the evidence 
whatever my situation is, what's the evidence I can produce that I'm making a difference in the lives right. of children, not just, oh, let's add, you know, I'm going to advocate. I don't like that word Ross talks about, what, you know, that word is not a helpful word, but mm -hmm. what is the evidence that I'm making a difference? Yeah. And regardless of my situation, mm -hmm. I can provide some sort of evidence that I am making a difference, and that's mm -hmm. what's going to change things, not, again, waiting for somebody somewhere else to provide evidence that school libraries are making a difference, but that I and my building are making a difference. Right. So I was happy to have the opportunity to go to that conference and kind of um, help show how evidence-based practice can also be used by school librarians, not just um, medical librarians or, or so forth. So that was a nice experience for me, and I met some interesting people. Yeah. So. so do school school libraries, uh, are they responsible for sort of the instructional computing stuff that goes on in, in schools? On the, it depends on yeah. Again, like in North Carolina, the, the, they have instruction, what do they call them? Technology facilitators. Some schools mm -hmm. have to technology facilitators, so they are mm -hmm. in charge of the instructional right. technology, so to speak, and then the mm -hmm. school librarians. They're supposed to all <coughs> collaborate together right. and you know make integrate mm -hmm. in technology into the instruction. So, mm -hmm. and in some school districts, the librarian does all of it. You know, troubleshoots mm -hmm. the printers and mm -hmm. whatever else, and takes care of everything. Mm -hmm. So, it varies. So how, how do we prepare students uh, to sort of go into these jobs? What's the curriculum like here? Uh, say, just start with here at UNC. At UNC. Yeah. <laughs> One of my um, new pet projects is yeah. to figure out how to incorporate more technology in authentic ways into mm -hmm. the teaching that I do. So mm -hmm. the students here take the core courses. Mm -hmm. Then they're also required to take um, the children's resources course, mm -hmm. the young adult resources course, and then they take a course on um, that's called... Um, Curriculum and the Media Specialist, and then one that's called Administering the School Library Media Program. Mm -hmm. So they're the four courses that are more focused on youth services. Mm -hmm. And the other courses, um, I think it's wonderful because the faculty allows the school library students, or whoever, whoever's interested sure. in whatever, to focus their projects on that topic. So right. we talk about how does um, HCI fit into the school mm -hmm. library environment, right. how does right. um, management fit into mm -hmm. that environment. Mm -hmm. But those are the four courses that they take specifically related to the practice of school librarianship. And so, um, a lot of leadership kinds mm -hmm. of experiences, and again, uh, uh, trying to, f and a lot of ideas about getting them to understand that their role in the school is to support the school curriculum, not just the library curriculum. <laughs> that this li school library exists to support the entire school environment, and that part of what we do is teach information literacy, but that's only a part of what we do. And so the same thing with the um, technology, that yes, we want to use technology in the school library program, but what we also want to be able to do is to help teachers use technology in their teaching and learning that will then improve, their teaching that will then improve student learning. And so what a lot of what I try to do is kind of give them that expanded view of how do they, and, and Evelyn did, does too, mm -hmm. and, and the adjuncts who teach for us, you know, how to, giving the school library students an understanding that they are a part of a bigger environment, and what is that environment like, and what do they have to know about that environment to be able to do what it is that they do and do it successfully. Right. So a lot of talk about, you know, what are standards, and mm -hmm. how do we help teachers design curriculum to meet standards and how do we incorporate information literacy standards into that instruction and how do we assess in authentic ways and how do we use technology in authentic ways not mm -hmm. just um, you know PowerPoint to right. enhance a lecture <laughs> but you know how, how can we use podcasting or mm -hmm. you know whatever the new technology is to really improve student learning right. And so that's kind of, you know, sort of the focus. So now I'm trying to, fig as I said, I'm trying to figure out how to bring more of that technology in, because I'm learning about the new technology sure. myself. And so how do I bring that into my teaching so that mm -hmm. when the students go out, they can can use technology. So I'm doing a, two studies right now. One, we just, um, with a doctoral student here, Dana Hansen Baldorf, and we just um, did a survey of pre-service school library media specialists in 46 ALA accredited schools and 33 wow. in Cape accredited schools, because I just wrote this up, that's why I know the numbers, <laughs> yeah. looking at their competency and use of different technologies, and then the um, integration of those technologies into the coursework they had, and how prepared they feel to go out into the field and integrate technology into mm -hmm. their instruction. So that's kind of, we're writing that up right mm -hmm. now. So, And I want mm -hmm. to, when we come back to school, <laughs> right. 
survey all of the rest of the faculty to find out what technology that in the core courses that mm -hmm. the school library people must take find out which technology that you're using in your instruction so I know okay they got exposed to this they had an opportunity to do a blog you know so they understand right. how to create that or whatever right. it is it's the mm -hmm. new technology so I'm not responsible for doing it all we are yeah. as a faculty responsible for educating mm -hmm. and the students in that respect as well so the, the school media specialists I've known over uh, my career have, have been, um, you mentioned leadership, and, and uh, I think uh, that, that's a good word because uh, you have to be a leader to sit mm -hmm. sort of, you're, you're not really an administrator, you're not really a classroom teacher, you're neither fish nor fowl, you're in between, an, an intermediary, and it does take a lot of mm -hmm. management and leadership skills. Mm -hmm. And you can have a really powerful, you can play a very powerful role if mm -hmm. you can uh, figure out how you fit in and how to negotiate right. both both of those roles and and take on as you, you know the role of coach or facilitator mm -hmm. or mediator right. in that environment you can make a big difference in schools um, and and that's something that comes i mean the other thing i tell the students here is or, and i told them at drexel too is you're not going to do this the first day you go out right. you know yeah. it's going to take you time to mm -hmm. to develop the trust and the confidence in yourself mm -hmm. to be able to to, to take on that leadership role, but if you can go in and you understand the curriculum, if you understand the lives of teachers, if you understand how to design instruction, how to um, to implement instruction, how to assess, you're going to be a lot more ahead of the game than if you just go in and understand the library sorts of principles. Right. You need to you know see yourself fitting into that larger environment and understanding the role that you can play in that environment. So. So uh, yeah, it sounds like it's a great time to be uh, become a school uh, media specialist. Uh, I think so, oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this morning uh, we were talking with um, Claudia Gallup about reference and how exciting it can be to to be a reference librarian today. And I, I think the I'm hearing some of the same kinds of. Uh, of excitement uh, for a school library it, media specialist. It was great with Kazali was in Washington. How many of our students were there? Of mm -hmm. the, the people I'd had in class, who right. I were going to become school librarians. Yeah. I know there were other students there, but I, yeah. it was great for me to go into a session and see them because that shows me that here are people who, you know, nobody was paying their way. Nobody was. Right. They didn't have to go for a course. We're going to the, or to see authors speak, which mm -hmm. is always interesting. But right. um, they were going to the sessions on. You know, I, I went to one on video gaming and mm -hmm. what we can learn about from video gaming about instruction, teaching information literacy, and there were students there. Right. And mm -hmm. you know, it was nice to see them at those sessions that were focused on instruction and how to improve instruction right. because they saw so much saw that as a part of their role. And mm -hmm. so it was great seeing them around throughout the conference. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that just made me feel good about the future. Right. <laughs> Oh, and there was also one other thing that made me feel very good about the future. There was a school li um, public library here in Cary, and she had done a, a book discussion group with her t the teenagers in her community, and she brought those teenagers oh, to the wow. American Library Association conference, and they all had on T-shirts. Now I can't remember the name of the library. Yeah. It could be a great plug for that public library right. system, but they all had on T-shirts that said yeah. the name of their pub something Perry, me and Perry Public Library, but they were all there with their T-shirts yeah. on walking around, meeting all the authors, oh, and they were so great. excited about just libraries yeah. and literacy, and yeah. it was just a great, um, I went and talked to those folks too, because yeah. I was yeah. excited to see them there, sure. so yeah. that made me feel good about the future. <laughs> Teenagers well, again, in a positive light. <laughs> well, you're, you're dealing with um, the most important resource we have, our future, our, our, our youth. And, um, so uh, it's, uh, it's great to have you here uh, at, at UNC. and. Um, you have other things you'd like to say? Um, no, um, this, this then I'm we'll happy to be here. <laughs> thank you very much for your time and good luck with your research and uh, making a difference. <laughs> okay, thanks.